All right, so those of you who are watching us live, welcome. I am excited to um, have Ellen uh, Petrie Lianz on the podcast with me today, and specifically right now for a live interview slash discussion on the topic of happiness. Uh, so Ellen is a technology pioneer. She's an alum of Apple, Google, and a range of entrepreneurial ventures. And she works at the crossroads of neuroscience, systems thinking, and mindfulness practices. So a very good fit for the audience uh, that listens to the podcast. She teaches at Stanford University. She guides individuals and organizations to increase impact and purpose through sustainable mindsets and skills. So thank you, uh, uh, Ellen, for joining me today on this live interview slash discussion. Thank you so much, Noah. Um, Secular Buddhism is my go-to podcast, and it's really so much fun and such an honor to be here. So thank you, and hello to everybody out there who's joined us this morning. Okay, so we have several things to jump into here. The overall topic for our conversation today is happiness. Um, and I think this is such a, a vital uh, topic to discuss because happiness is one of those things that we're all after, right? We, we all want to experience this. Um, but I, I feel like at times uh, we may not fully understand what it actually is. Like, what does it actually mean to be happy? I had this thought the other day thinking about love, like we all want to be loved or to love, but what does that actually mean? And when I spent time thinking about it like that, I realized it's really hard to define. Uh, and I think happiness falls in that same vein of uh, maybe, maybe it's not what we think it is, or we'll understand it better if we, if we learn about what's really going on in our mind and in our brain uh, from an emotional standpoint, but also from a physiological standpoint, the actual chemicals that cause us to feel the way that we feel. And uh, Ellen is the expert to talk to uh, about this topic. So I was really excited when I picked up her book, The Happiness Hack. We'll talk a little bit about this. Um, as I read through it and, and, and seeing that um, the, the close correlation between the neuroscience of happiness and the mindfulness-based approach under, uh, to the understanding of happiness, I thought was really well done and really well explained. Um, so before we jump into the, the book, uh, Ellen, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your journey with the topic of happiness? What led you to be uh, an expert on the topic of happiness? And for those listening, uh, by expert, I mean, uh, Ellen has given a, a TEDx talk, Happiness by Design, which you can check out on TED's website. Uh, and then, of course, the author of The Happiness Hack, A Brain-Aware Guide to Life Satisfaction. So tell us a little bit about that journey, Ellen. Thank you, Noah. You know, um, I think I'm still a learner about it because there's so much more to be known about happiness and what creates that feeling that we all crave and, you know, covetous that we think is sort of our set point or our maybe our aspiration in human experience. But, you know, I think a number of years back, as I talk about in the book, I was living a life that probably from the outside looking in seemed like something anybody should be happy with. And mind you, there were many things that brought me deep joy and satisfaction, uh, connection with my family, my sons, um, the times when I felt really aligned with my personal intention, the sort of work I, I found satisfaction in doing. And even in some of the very simple things of, you know, caring for a family and, and having a home and so forth. But there was this other thing happening on the surface that felt very confusing and I didn't know what it was about. And I, I really couldn't understand why there was a sort of static in my life about the internal things that I knew made me happy and the things that seemed to be getting validation and approval in the outside world. And the validation and approval, I have to say, I saw it probably as much as any other human saw it, but it's kind of about the, the public facing persona, the everyday being great, the... Um, the things we bought or owned or wore or whatever it was were the things that tended to get the, the, the approval rather than the things that really made me happy. Like the highlight of my day might have been sitting with one of my children before he went to bed and reading or really talking about the day. But the things that got the most 
validation and celebration on the outside world were you know, completely different than that. And I felt confused. And I started reading about the topic of, of you know, sort of life purpose and what it really meant to be a, a satisfied human and to have a good life, everything from the Stoics to the sciences. And it was when I stumbled upon uh, my first books about neuroscience and understanding some of the chemical um, processes in the brain and really aligning that with things I read in psychology and in other disciplines, I started seeing that there were cycles in the brain that could easily be exploited and validated externally that would create a certain type of, of reinforcement or check off the box like, ah, yes, this is good and it's making sense that actually really weren't working for me. And as I thought more deeply about it and learned more, I realized they weren't really working that well for other people either. And so I started diving deeper into the way the brain works, looking at, you know, certainly at our emotional and memory systems, and then the cognitive systems that sort of wrap around those and create our experience of reality or our perception of reality, more, more aptly put. Um, and then the icing on the cake is when I started studying uh, the work of the Buddha and the wisdom of the Buddha and began to realize that, you know, 3,000 years ago under the Bodhi tree, someone came to this deep understanding on a, on a, a mind-bogglingly, mind-blowingly uh, perceptive and deep level that really explained the human condition and why we so often get happiness wrong. I love that. Um, yeah, something that stood out to me in your book, you talk about how your experience with unhappiness and, and how something clicked when you started learning about your brain. Um, and what I enjoyed about your book, it, it, in some ways it, it, it reads like a manual. Uh, like if you understand what's going on, it's, it's easier to work with what you're experiencing whether that be suffering or discomfort or, you know, on, on, in this case, we're talking about happiness. What, what is actually happening when we're experiencing these emotions? Um, and you, you, you mention well, one of the things I want to talk about first is uh, what, what is happiness? How do you define happiness? Because, you know, there's, there's the chemical composition of, of what you feel, but there's more to it. Tell, tell me a little bit about your, view of the definition of happiness what are we talking about when we're talking about happiness you know no all i can say is it's a great question isn't it like i think that's one of the things that's really um hard to define but i would imagine I, I, you know happiness we would probably use generically to the feeling that things are making sense and that we're fitting into something bigger and that we are if you know that we are validated, although I'm a little bit careful for this, this with this word, validated for the way we are participating in a fuller reality. However, I think there is another meaning of happiness that has been sort of hijacked, if you will, by many of the experiences that we, that we uh, have in, in modern life. So if we go back on an evolutionary level, we go back to our biology when we were, you know, um, a very different type of, of, of living a very ty different type of human life than we're living today. Happiness might be the reward we would feel from, say, someone bringing home uh, a, a, something from a hunt or from a gather that would allow the clan to sustain itself. So in that, there would be a couple of different types of happiness happening. There would be the reward we would get from the dopamine cycle. So the dopamine cycle flows from a motivation to an achievement to a reward sort of loop. Um, and uh, so we would have that dopamine charge that we would get. And dopamine was very important for motivating early humans to get through some of the challenges they had to face simply in order to survive. Um, I'd love to segue for a moment into the concept of distraction. Distraction is usually associated with the dopamine motivation you know, sort of achievement and reward cycle. Distraction served our survival when we were earlier humans. We might be walking along a path and see, you know, a little grub on a tree 
and you know and go and grab it and we have the satisfaction not only of then having nourishment but of of you know a high sought and so that distraction had a certain type of reward but if you think of distraction at that time we we're probably getting distracted by things well, by the way one other thing on distraction more than likely it was also if something rustled in the grass we could say oh, and then fire the amygdala response and and flee or fight as needed if something was putting us in peril Today, distraction is manufactured, and it's manufactured by people who fully understand the dopamine look, loop and that jolt of happiness that it gives us and know how to exploit it through the images they show us, the, uh, the buttons they give us to click, all of these different things that are causing us to be distracted, not only a few times a day in order to find a little opportunistic nibble to eat, but, or to avoid a, a, a potential danger, but to do what they want us to do, which is engage with their products or engage with their experiences or buy the thing that they're selling. And so our dopamine experience has been largely hijacked by all of this onslaught of media and technology that, that is in our lives. However, if you talk to people, they're not going to tell you that makes them happy. They're going to say, I wasted hours doing this. I was with a friend over Thanksgiving weekend. And he said, you know, my gosh, I've been doing this now for 20 minutes. I've completely wasted 20 minutes. Why did I keep doing it? Right. And we've all been there. So this is posing as happiness, but it's not really what happiness is on a human level and human happiness. My book asserts and, um, as do you know, many psychologists, philosophers, scientists, and many more, is much more about the, uh, the serotonin cycles, which are really what it's what the ancients called eudaimonic happiness, and it's the happiness you work for. It's true satisfaction. It's when you have done something that personally expresses you and your unique talents and purpose in a way that serves others or allows you to grow or creates this feeling that I've made a small corner of the world more beautiful than it was before. And thus something that I've done really matters. And this is a much, you know, com compared to what I call the tequila shot happiness of dopamine, which it's on the counter and you shoot it and then you go, Oh, what was I thinking? This is the one where you go, no, I'm pushing it away. I have to be with friends tomorrow, or I have a hike in the morning, or I have work tomorrow. And you have this feeling of satisfaction, like I did the right thing. And that's the serotonin satisfaction that I believe is largely getting hijacked by these externally created dopamine experiences. Hmm. Okay, I like that. Um, so it sounds like what you're saying, um, the distinction between these types of happiness part of our problem is lies in how we're defining happiness, right? Like the um, looking for the, the instant gratification and the feeling that that gives us versus the feeling that we get when we've accomplished something that we've set out to do. Um, so it sounds to me like uh, the definition, whether well, like if, if I know the definition, I'm one step ahead of myself now, right? Because I can, I can start to see, wait, why am I really doing this? Is, am I going for that instant gratification shot of happiness? Or am I working towards something bigger here that gives me a greater sense of joy? Um, so I can see how awareness plays uh, an important part in this. Um, would you say that it's fair to say that um, when we're not aware we may be going for that instant shot without realizing that it's the instant shot. We may be experiencing even the, the gratification of the instant shot and not realizing it. Like you, you mentioned specifically, uh, yeah, I do this. And then I'm like, Oh, why did I do that? But what about those scenarios where we don't say, Oh, why did I do that? Because we think that what we got was what we wanted. So we stay in that cycle and we keep going. First of all, that's a great, thank you for synopsizing it so well, boom on all. So a really important adage from the field of neuroscience is your brain will do more of whatever it's doing right now. So the brain is constantly updating its hypothesis of what it takes for you to be safe and to survive. So we say, you know, what's the purpose of the brain? Nine people out of 10 are going to say, oh, to think. Well, you're right. The brain does think and it's, it's really good at it. 
But most of what your brain is going to do is think in service of keeping you safe and alive. That's our evolutionary biology. So your brain will do more of whatever you're doing right now. So a really good word to use here is normalize. Whatever you're doing, the brain will normalize as part of its hypothesis of what keeps you safe and alive. So if you're doing things that are, that are uh, sort of riding that dopamine tide, your brain is going to go, oh my gosh, that's what it takes to survive. And many people will say that the brain never evolved to the point where in the moment it can tell the difference between a dopamine charge and something that's going to give you the, the more lasting sort of serotonin feeling. I'm not sure I agree because if you look at in Buddhism, the, the discussion of you know, an appropriate response, right? That we are going to work with the responsive mind rather than the reactive mind, which is very much why we meditate and why we train the brain to the moment to moment awareness. You're going to see that we have some understanding of the react, uh, the, the react work of the, the fast brain right here, or even of the dopamine loop and the response of the more disciplined, intentional, aware, and mindful, more serotonin associated. And it, it's not exactly like puzzle piece match here, but they're more sort of associated with each other. But of, of, the, of the response modality, which is consideration, which is mindfulness, which is awareness. So for example, I might be using my phone, which is, you know, we all have them right here near us. And I, I, I don't get alerts, but let's say I go and check how something I posted on Instagram is doing. Oh, did people like that really great picture I posted last night? And I go in, I could, I could look and see what my likes are, respond to my comments or whatever. But then because of the way dopamine works, I'm very motivated. Well, what's the next thing below? What's the next thing below? And start scrolling, scrolling, scrolling through it. But if I have trained myself to say, Ah, oh, look at your dopamine at work, right? Or even have dopamine alert, right? And then to say, what matters now? What, what really matters now? I can find an awareness that brings me back to what really matters more and get off of that hijack. And we can, if the brain will do more of whatever it's doing right now, we can look at an example like that and say, oh my gosh, the more I stop myself and remind myself to break this biological cycle, the more likely I am to get more of what I'm really seeking on a deeper level and invite in a new biological cycle that's actually much healthier for me and much more desirable for me and much more in keeping with my purpose in life. And by the way, it is, it is healthier for you because between dopamine and serotonin are very, very different chemical responses associated with stress chemicals, which we... I'd love to get into maybe in another conversation, but, but that's, that's a whole different thing. Suffice to say that serotonin is much more associated with healthy body physiologically, physio, physiology and, and stress management, even stress reduction than dopamine is, which is very linked to cortisol cycles. Um, did that answer your question or anything like it, Noah? I hope I did. Yeah, it did. And in fact, you brought up something that I think really well with the mindfulness-based approach. You talked about uh, the normalization, you know, the idea that this is what I always do, so it feels normal, and so I keep doing it. Um, from the Buddhist perspective, that's what we would call conditioning, right? The conditioned mind is, you could say, the normalized mind, and we, we become habitually reactive. Uh, and I don't just mean reactive in the sense of something happens and I react. I just mean my very thoughts can be reactive. A certain thought triggers a certain thought and that thought triggers a certain thought, right? That process itself can be my habitual reactivity. Now, if I understand that what's happening in my mind is this process of normalization that you're talking about, what I may find is a scenario, which I've, I've seen, uh, I may even be experiencing it. I, I'm not sure because I think sometimes we, it's really hard to see it in ourselves. But I've seen this recently where someone was saying, I'm, I'm so grateful for um, the happiness that I have in my life. And I was listening thinking, wait a second, you don't seem like a happy person. You know, I always hear, I always hear complaining or, or this or that. But I thought how fascinating that this person's baseline of happiness seems normal and in their mind it's up here it's like i'm this i'm, I'm this happy person where from another perspective someone may be looking thinking 
no, you're not really a happy person. Um, could that be the normalization that we're talking about that, uh, you know what I mean? I think from the mindfulness based approach, that's what we're saying, not just about happiness, but about everything is we're, we become habitual in our thought patterns our um, why well, especially in our thought patterns so so you know this is the idea that um, there's this uh, quote that's attributed to the Buddha that's not really a quote from the Buddha but um, the the general idea is and the idea is that what we become what we think right so what we're thinking constantly determines how we are and I think if you apply that to uh, a concept like happiness um, you can be in a position where you think you're living this happy life, but maybe you're not, maybe you're, uh, you know, I, I, I'm thinking of my experience that I've talked about many times on the podcast of looking for Chris, my supplier in China. And my assumption was that Chris was a man. And when I went to meet with Chris, there was Chris and I couldn't see him because he wasn't a him. He was, you know, she was there. And eventually I, I, I did find her and realized I was shocked to discover, oh, that's not who I had in my mind this whole time of who Chris was. Um, I think we, we do that with a lot of concepts. Happiness is a concept, right? It's, whatever your definition of happiness is, that may be blinding you from discovering what happiness really is. Does that sound applicable in this case? Oh, yes, all that and more. And I, I, I want to come back to Chris in a moment. But first, I'd like to go back to the person who said, I'm so grateful for my happiness, who didn't feel like a happy person. Two things hit me. One of them is that um, I think there's so much pressure on people to be a happy person right now, which is so, it, it really saddens me to think of that because um, so much of our image of what happiness is, is based on things that we might see on a, you know, a, a billboard or a, a commercial or something like that. That just these grinning, joyful people living a perfect life or with these highly curated and selective feeds that we're exposed to of, you know, people sharing their family moments and their, their, uh, you know, their, their, their fabulous vacations. Or others. I love to call it the, the disease of fabulitis, you know, that we have this sort of contagious fabulousness that we're all supposed to aspire to. And it leaves us feeling short or left out or, you know, that we're not quite achieving, like we've, we've fallen off of that. And so, we strive harder to fill in the gap by proving we're as happy and as fabulous as that too. And this is all, as I said, this is largely a chemical hijack. And it's, um, it's really something that I think a lot of people are suffering with. Like so-and-so has this perfect life. We all probably know friends that we know intimately and closely enough to know that they have, you know, bad days and, uh, stumbles and even, you know, bad hair days and everything as much as any other human does, but we're never going to see this on their social feeds. You know, I have friends, for example, who have, they, they have young kids. My kids are grown, but you know, they're, they're, they're going to show the, they're going to show the, the high points, but they're not going to show the 3 a.m. wake-ups and what it felt like to be so tired getting ready for work the next morning. So this real artificial concept of what the baseline is. And if we really think about that, how that baseline came about, it's really what you were saying about, you know, that um, the thought that you, you said that the thought triggers thought and that this um, habitually reactive sort of conditioning that we get that says there's a way we're supposed to be. And if we do these things, we will be it. And then finally, we will feel the way we've been hoping to feel. And clearly that was a problem in the time of Buddha because these are some of the things that he really dove into when he was trying to answer these big questions that shaped his life. You know, even thinking of the skandhas, for example, when he really broke out how the brain responds to these external stimuli and really referencing our our, our long-term memory, our short-term memory, our emotions, you know, all of these other things. That's exactly how it works. But it can trick us if we let it. And the way to break through that is to understand that, yes, our minds do become conditioned. That is how we survived in the, back in the, the, the jungle and the millions of years on our evolutionary tree that preceded that, we were responding and learning from our environments in ways that, that, that shaped our survival. 
as we advanced as humans and as we developed these very unique four brains right here, the prefrontal cortexes, new types of thinking came in that created possibilities for us that very ironically were sort of in tension with some of these earlier, more fast brain, uh, more, uh, to use computer jargon here, debugged processing systems in our brain. And this tension is our challenge and our opportunity. And it's really what the Buddha looked at when, you know, exploring react versus respond. It's exactly like Daniel Kahneman's book that I'm sure many listeners will have heard of about the fast brain and the slow brain. But what Kahneman didn't do that the Buddha does is guide us to ways of shifting gears, and my book talks about this with the car analogy, between these two modalities so that we can move toward more of what, we, what really brings us happiness. You know, I'm so grateful for my happiness when I don't feel happiness. My heart hurts for that person because she, like so many others, have been conditioned to say, my life is supposed to be a little bit better or different than it is now, or if only I had this or that, then finally I'd have the happiness. And then we get, we get these messages that say, you know, again, you know, states lead to traits and maybe they do over time, but that if we think it, it, we can create it. That's true to an extent, but perhaps underlying those words that say, I'm grateful for my happiness is this state that so many of us feel that says, it's not quite what it should be. And that's the thing that really holds us from finding satisfaction. Yeah, I, I, that really resonates with me. The idea of uh, being caught up in this world of, of, of thinking there's a way it should be and how that thought can rob us of, of happiness. Um, I want to touch on something that you mentioned really quickly with the, the evolution of the brain, the uh, as Daniel Kahneman in Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow talks about the fast and the slow, the more primitive and the and the more evolved parts of the brain. Um, correlating this to the teaching in Buddhism of the two arrows, I, I just thought this is kind of a neat connection here. But where the you know the teaching is that there are two that you you can get shot by an arrow and you can't do anything about it. You've been shot by an arrow, that's it. But you can pick up a second arrow and aggravate the wound. Right. And it's like, it's like you get shot and then you pick up that second arrow and you're like, why did you have to shoot me here? Right. And you're poking at that spot with that second arrow. Um, I was thinking about this with the correlation of the, of the, the more evolved part of the mind. What makes us human is uh, we can think that's one thing. So do animals, but we think about thinking, right. And maybe that's that second layer where there's what we're experiencing happiness as an emotion. Um, and then there's the thinking about happiness. Should I be happy? Is this happy enough? Do I need more of it? You know, things of that nature that start to bring in the second layer or the second arrow element that goes beyond. Now I'm not just sitting with the original emotion, you know, taking it in saying, wow, this is great. Cause I'm thinking now I'm, uh, you know, maybe that I'm guilty for feeling happy or something along those lines. So right. So you've invited in the perfect entry to uh, the limbic system, which is, it's at the very core of our brain, the cognitive parts of the brain, the, the cortex wrap around it. And it's actually quite deep back in the brain. You know, we can think of an evolutionary model of the brain that survival mechanisms evolved from back, you know, sort of moving up toward the front of the, the brain. And then the more cognitive things started to evolve, leading to the prefrontal cortex up at the um, right here at the forehead. Here's the prefrontal cortex. I love when I talk about the brain is you can give your prefrontal cortex a hug by putting your fingers together and then sort of wrapping your forehead like that. That's sort of uh, where your, prefrontal, your PFC is. But, mm -hmm. you know, let's tie this into the emotional center of the brain, which is, is it's, if you look at it anatomically, it really is nestled right in there with all of the motor and cognitive and, you know, perception parts of the brain. Mind you, in Buddhism, we don't talk about the senses. We talk about the sense gates or the sense doors and how they bring in information from the outside world where it's simply interpreted by the brain. And that's fully integrated with, um, 
the, all of the cognitive parts, but also with our limbic system, which is emotions and memories. That's sort of, in the book I talk about, it's like a rubber band ball, you know, layer upon layer at the center of the brain. You know, a, a teacher of mine once asked a question. He, he was asking me to describe a, a, to have a memory that, that, that filled me with, you know, a sense of, of enjoyment or pleasure. And I described to him this really beautiful place, sort of my happy place and how I like going, how I loved visualizing it. And he goes, where is the beauty? And of course, that was such a beautiful question because the beauty is inside. I mean, it's still in that place over on the North Shore of Oahu, but I'm not seeing it right now, but the beauty is still there inside. So the brain always has its maps and perceptions of what you, what you value or enjoy or fear or feel shameful of or retreat from because of the way cognition works with that core limbic system with that memory and emotion center in the beginning. So you might, to your question about the two arrows, uh, Noah, you might experience a moment of happiness followed by a sense of I don't deserve this or there's shame or something like that. That is the limbic system and its entrenched patterns and those more familiar bands around the rubber band ball of your emotional and memory, long-term memory experiences, much of which, by the way, is subconscious. You know, we're not even aware of what those things are. Like the rubber band ball, they're wadded up in the middle. And we don't even know what all the other bands are built around. But that second arrow is the association probably with subconscious thoughts in the limbic system. And there is a special word for moments like that that I think is really helpful. And that is information. When we have that second arrow experience, we say, ah, I felt good, but then I judged it or I retreated from it or I said I wasn't worthy or whatever. The, the, what was happening there? Oh, now I see. I was wounding myself with a second arrow. And then remove the judgment or shame that we might often feel in a moment like that. So we might say, I'm always limiting myself. I won't let myself get happy. You know, what's my problem? We might say something like that. That's a third arrow and maybe even yeah. a fourth arrow. So when we have it, when we get that second arrow, that is a really great invitation to be grateful for that information so that we can say, look what I'm doing and say, wait, pause, move into the responsive, not reactive mind, the fast mind, which is so much faster, the responsive brain and go, no, really, I, I really want to enjoy this happiness, or it doesn't serve me to wound myself with a second arrow through old judgments that don't even fit into my life. And then we can start to build other patterns. And remember, whatever the brain is doing right now, the brain will do more of. So we're actually beginning that pattern and then love your brain and forgive it for that because remember the brain's job is to keep you safe and alive and in order to do that it can only draw on past experiences whether they're known or unknown whether they're uh, conscious or sub or unconscious it's still going to draw upon those pathways because per the brain's definition it's done its job perfectly if you're still alive right? Everything mm -hmm. is working perfectly. It loves if you're wounding yourself with those fourth and fifth and sixth arrows, if that's kept you alive. And it's going to tell you to keep on doing that until sure. you say, thanks to the prefrontal cortex, no, there is another way. Huh. I love that. In fact, when I was reading your book, that, I, that whole section of the rubber bands uh, really stood out to me. So I, I, I want to correlate that again really quickly. Uh, what you mentioned in the book is you can have an object and if you start wrapping rubber bands around it, uh, um, you, d you keep doing that, right? Rubber band after rubber band, eventually you have this big ball of rubber bands that can bounce. It does whatever it does because of what's inside. And at some point you don't, you may not even know what's at the core of it. Uh, and I had this thought when I was reading that thinking, you know, there, there's always this thought that, um, especially in Buddhism, there are causes and conditions to all natural phenomena. And, and I think sometimes that puts us in this mindset, well, if I can go back far enough and find what's inside the rubber band, then it'll fix all my problems. Um, but I don't know that we can sometimes. It may be, you know, there's, there's an emotion that was triggered by a memory that was triggered by some other emotion and some other memory. It may be so complex that I'm left with this situation where all I know is I've got this band of uh, uh, rubber bands into a ball and I know what it does. If I drop it, it bounces. I know that. And I know that that happens because of what's inside, but I don't even know what's inside. Is right. it enough to, to conclude? I'll never know what's inside, but at least I know that 
I understand it now. When I drop it, it bounces. And, and that's what I have to work with. <laughs> it's, that's so nice. You know, it's so much fun when, um, you know, you, there's an idea that's out there and you just sort of, I'm sure you experience this in your work, Noah, but you sort of offer the idea and then people come back with ways of building on it that really enrich it and add to it. So that's, that was beautiful. Thank you. It's a great analogy. And in fact, there are m many systems for, you know, solving problems in life or self-knowledge, self-awareness, really go back to let's dig and dig and dig and see if we can pry open and find out what's on the, in the middle of that rubber band ball. And, you know, I, I'm, I certainly have no judgment about that. I think it can be a, a good path and really a necessary path in some situations. But all of us have the ability to watch our reactions and watch our responses to the things that are happening around us. And on the external layer, and this is a metaphor, of course, of that rubber band ball, are the thoughts that we're most familiar with and use most often. Those are the things on the outer layer. Those are the things that we access first, if you will. And if we become aware of what our our sort of our, our, our usual responses might be or our usual reactions might be, being aware of those, I believe, lets it sort of soften, if you will, the tension on those and maybe look below at the next layer. You know, I wish I had a rubber band ball to show now because yeah. you can kind of pry something apart and go, oh, yeah, there's a wide gray one down there and then there's a red one. You're never going to get to the middle. It would take a lot of time and so forth, but Anyway, we're still in metaphor land. It's not like this is a scientific fact. It's simply a way of explaining it. But sure. if we are aware of what's happening on a surface level, there are things that are actually quite easy to do. And that is we can put some new bands on top of it, right? So that we go to those responses before we go to the ones we're more conditioned to. And that's something that can be done through intentional practices or reflective practices or even you know, new habit building and so forth. Or we can really say, no, you know, I want to sort of soften that reaction and maybe even remove a band or two. So, for example, if there's something you're doing that's not serving you, that, that wounding with the second arrow, awareness is a way of saying, okay, I can remove that more conditioned or habitual response if I stay committed to it. Um, or I can add a new pattern. I'm going to take a deep breath whenever I feel these emotions so that I have a pause to reflect before I go into a habitual response. But yes, even awareness of that rubber band ball at a surface level is enough to start navigating your life with a different outlook and set of expectations. I'm 100% with you on that. Cool. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking when in my own meditative practice, I feel like that description of prying open the rubber bands, um, I feel like I know I have certain sensitivities about certain topics or things that I can trace back and say, it's because of this. This is what's at the core of that. Yeah. Um, but there are others where I, I don't. I, all I know is that it's, it goes somewhere, but I don't know how far back or exactly why. It may be genetic. Uh, I may believe or not believe certain things based on experiences my parents had or you know, however many generations back. Uh, do, you know, uh, and I get that. I don't have to understand the source. I just know that um, what I think, what I tend to think as the solid way of being, the way Noah is, isn't real. It's not solid. It's it's layers. I, you know, everything that I think and say and do, I'm part of that rubber band of causes and conditions that extend from what I've inherited from my society, from uh, family beliefs, you know, on and on and on. Um, and it's just helpful to know that even if I can't get to the end of that process. <laughs> I actually think, Noah, that is the invitation. That is the this sort of like, ha ha, got you experience of being a human is that we are all the product of our genetics, our epigenetics, which is really our, you know, bio, it's sort of the, 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 the very, very biological response to environment. So genetics, epigenetics, and then our conditioning. That's sort of what makes a human, if you will, personality. And knowing that, we can say, ha ha, this is how we are. 
if we leave it to that, and this is where something else can rise, which is more, I don't know what to call it, but in the book we talk about it as the watcher, using a, you know, a term that some uh, Buddhist practitioners use. But we have this invitation for this other thing that we seem to be able to separate from simply those you know, chemical reactions and firing pathways that we can start to put our hands on the wheel and drive a little bit. And the first step is exactly that sort of awareness. We all are the products of these forces. Now, what do we do with it? That really is the question. Okay, well, let's get into that a little bit more. Um, so first, I, I, I want to address a topic of happiness in terms of, is happiness a paradox? And what I mean by that is um, I've had experiences before where uh, one of them, funny Funny story was I was, I'm about an hour away from uh, a good friend who lives down in, in Salt Lake, which is about 45 to 60 minutes away. And on uh, one, or he has these weekly meditation groups. So one week I was planning to go down there and I planned ahead of time because I knew it would take me an hour to get there on time. And it was at a new location. I hadn't been to that spot before. So I put it in the GPS I get there and as soon as I pull up, it seems like this doesn't seem like the right place. So I, 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 I switched from Apple Maps to Google Maps and to see if it would take me to the same place and it didn't. It told me to go somewhere else. Long story short, I, I, I'm starting to feel um, you know, the emotion of, of discomfort and frustration and I'm upset because I can't get to where I'm supposed to get so I can sit and relax. <laughs> that was the big irony is it's like I, want to, I wanted to go meditate that morning so that I could experience a little bit of uh, peace and contentment. Uh, and the very fact that I was trying to get there to do that was the reason I wasn't feeling it because I wasn't getting there. The GPS took me to the wrong place. And I had this thought in that moment, well, I could just be at home and I'd be at peace if I didn't want to come here and be at peace, right? <laughs> and, and I think that's the paradox. We do this with, with concepts like, like patience, for example. It's like, if I want to be patient, the more I want it, the, the less I have it, right? It's like, I want to be patient, but I want to be patient right now. Well, that's the very reason you can't be patient because the whole point of it is, you can't have it right now. You, you've got to be okay with having it whenever you have it. <laughs> and I, I wonder if happiness sometimes fits that same bill. And I think, you know, marketers know this. They, this is why they hijack it because they know that happiness, like everything else, is impermanent. And if we can convince you that, yeah, that thing that you thought was happy, that's not it. It's going to be this when you finally have this or when you finally drive this car or whatever it is they're selling you but then they know that that's not it. You finally get that and now you've got to have a new one every year or whatever it is because you're always chasing after it. And the very fact, I think that's the paradox. It's like you can't have it because you want it. That's the very reason you can't have it. Is that a fair assessment of happiness in general? Is it a paradox? I, I think paradox is the right word there for certain types of happiness. Mind you, you know, they're, again, they're, I truly think satisfaction the really the deeper satisfaction is kind of a different different thing than that. But if we think about happiness as conventionally described, yes, there is a myth we are told from the time we are very small and it's deeply conditioned into us, probably subconsciously and generationally or epigenetically in other ways. It's sort of, and maybe it's simply part of the human condition is as soon as this happens, I will be happy or as soon as I get there, I will be happy. I'm only one step away from it. You know, we sort of live our life on this game board of chasing happiness, believing there is a destination out there that when we land on it, boom, it's all there. But most of us by this point in our lives, you know, we probably know it doesn't really, it's, it's not working. Like we probably thought as soon as I get that first job after I graduate from college, then I'll be happy. As soon as I do this, you know, this life milestone, own this, acquire this. No, it's, that is the paradox of it, right? And probably part of how that works, there's a lot of dopamine in that. And by the way, people talk about dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin, vasopressin, all of this. These are only 
the, the highlight reel of the brain chemicals. There are so many more that are woven into our experiences that we might not even, that we, we don't even know how to describe the subtlety and interaction of all of this. There's, there's other, you know, stuff too, the way the currents are flowing, the electromagnetic currents and so forth. But the paradox is, is that when this happens, we will be happy. Well, we might, we might feel for a moment like, you know, the first time we drive that new car or when we, you know, go out on that date or whatever it is. And we do get that jolt of that surge of sort of like, this is great. But the next day when we go back to things, there's still that as soon as, as soon as, as soon as we start living with. This is a true paradox in the human experience. It really is. And there's one, a question that I think is really important to invite if, if we experience that paradox. And I think all of us do. It's sort of the one I write about in my opening chapters. Like, I've done all the things I was supposed to do. Why don't I feel happy, right? I did everything that they told me to do. And here I am feeling like there's something more. Is there something wrong with me? Oh, I do think that is part of the human experience. And then the aha moment comes when we realize, wait a minute. It's sort of this sort of weird conundrum in that, first of all, the things that have brought me here are not the things that are going to bring me there if I'm really searching for real happiness. And then the other one is this sort of aha, which is like, wait, I'm already there. All I have is this moment. And it is my relationship with this moment that's going to define how I navigate every other moment that goes forward. And I can choose, and it's even more than choose, I can accept that this is what the path is. And once there is some acceptance of that, the paradox softens a little bit. There is a different type of invitation that we get to really drop in and feel you know, I'm, I'm careful using the word happy, but to feel like things make sense, to feel that there is a purpose to this, to feel that I do have some mastery of the path and to feel that I can find satisfaction punctuated by moments of dopamine charged happiness on it. Sure. Yeah, I like that you bring up the idea of the path. And in your book, you share um, a quote from Margaret Lee Runbeck, you said, uh, the quote is, happiness is not a station you arrive at, but a manner of traveling. And I think that that correlates so well with the mindfulness-based approach too, of, you know, the path is the goal. And, um, and, and the moment that we understand that now, we, like you said, now we can experience whatever life is throwing at us punctuated by those moments of dopamine, but we realized those weren't the goal. Those weren't the point, but all of that, everything is icing on the cake. You know, the, if you could say, what is the cake? It's being alive. That's the cake. You know, you're alive. Everything else is icing on the cake. <laughs> um, uh, so th which leads me to this thought is, you know, is, is there a natural state of happiness? Is there, um, do we get in the way of our own happiness because we don't understand what's going on in our minds? Uh, we don't understand the tricks that our minds play on us in terms of, of happiness. Um, there's a, what I'm thinking about here, what I'm alluding to is from the Buddhist perspective, there's this idea of Buddha nature, right? The, this is the unconditioned mind, your natural state of being. And there's a, a story of, uh, a Thai story of, of a, a golden Buddha statue at a monastery that um, the monks, uh, I guess the country was being invaded or something. So the monks cover up this golden statue with clay so that the invaders won't take it. And uh, the, then the monks, maybe they get killed. I don't know what happens, but they all disappear. So for years and years, um, this statue's there and it's just a, a clay looking statue. And I, by then, there are monks there again, but these guys don't know what the originals did. Someone at some point discovers that under this statue of clay, it really wasn't a clay statue. It's been a gold statue all along. And kind of the correlation of that story is that our essential nature is like the gold statue. It's enlightened. It's uh, awakened. Um, and, and, and this is the paradox of awakening or enlightenment too. It's like, you can't obtain it because you already are it. You can't, you know, you're not going to find those sunglasses you're looking for because they're already on your head. That's kind of the big, the big joke of it all. Is happiness the same? Is there a natural state of happiness? 
maybe maybe if we use a word like contentment or joy, um, is that our natural state? And we're not seeing it because we're frantically looking for those glasses, not realizing, hey, they're already on your head. Is there, what do you think of that? It's the, the clay and gold Buddha is the perfect analogy because I think that there is a natural state that is perhaps like the Buddha nature. And the, 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 there's no good word for that. It's a beingness or a presence or a sort of a, a, a feeling of a unique golden centeredness. But we are so busy looking for happiness that we don't see it because we think that that happiness, it's, a, it's really a beautiful metaphor is that the, the clay on the outside of the golden Buddha, the clay is what we think happiness is. Mm -hmm. But the gold. Yeah, we call that the conditioning from the yeah. Buddhist perspective, yes. Yeah. Exactly that, exactly that. And this is true cognitively, I mean, and, and really psychologically as well. In philo I mean, the funny thing is, is that so many different disciplines align around this, this, this concept of how the, 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 the clay shrouds the gold. The gold is not the feeling of happiness that we've been conditioned to think through the, the, the advertisements and commercials and, you know, likes and likes and likes. Right. And, so it's not the hit of dopamine. It's not. That's the clay. <laughs> yeah. But that's also, that's what a beautiful invitation to learn. Like that is there to tempt us and to sort of draw us away. And people can exploit those human, those cycles that we have to say, this is how you're going to find it. But the gold is inside all along. And it is that sort of dropping in, and we've all felt it at different moments. You know, we go back to our, you, you asked, is there something in our biology? Well, the answer is certainly yes. And, you know, I think if we look at, there's still some relatively intact human cultures uh, that have survived for, you know, tens and tens, and sometimes even more than tens. Like there's one that, the longest standing one is, uh, seems to have survived intact for about 130,000, possibly a little bit more years. But all of them have reflective practices that and and practices that uh challenge the dopamine cycles so for example there's one it's a southern african uh tribe that has been their culture has been intact for more than one hundred thousand years and when someone brings home uh like a, a kill to the clan which they're going to share because it's a collective they come back apologizing I'm sorry, I didn't get a very good one. The, you know, I didn't do as well as I could have on the hunt. And then get this, the people in the clan even come back and go, you know, like you call that an antelope, you know, like this sort of thing. So it's all about disrupting this usual striving that the human mind has for, look at me, I'm the best, you know, I got it, or I suck because I missed out, right? And it's about disrupting that and coming back to, I'm alive. We're together. There is some purpose to this that I don't understand. And lucky me, I get to be in it. That is the gold of the Buddha. <laughs> hmm. You know, I, as you were saying that, that I'm alive, I was thinking of uh, a quote by uh, Brother David Steindl Rust. And he, he talks about gratitude. And his, his quote says, uh, it's not happiness that makes us grateful. It's gratefulness that makes us happy. Um, and, and as I think about that in terms of what we're discussing, you know, these moments, so from the Buddhist point of view, we talk about suffering as the moment we want life to be other than it is, suffering arises. Um, I, it feels like the flip side of that is when we accept things as they are and, and, and we're grateful for things as they are, there's this sense of, feeling like nothing needs to change. Everything's just fine the way that it is. I think those are the moments where it's beyond this dopamine type happiness. This is like the deep, deep content and contentment and joy that we experience when nothing needs to be different than how it is. The moment is perfect just as it is. Um, and I think gratitude evokes that. When we're grateful, we're thinking about things as they are and, and we experience that feeling of, hey, I'm glad that it's this way. So therefore, it doesn't need to be any different. And maybe that's why happiness arises as a, uh, as a, a result of the gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was kind of my closing thought on that. But what I want to get to in, 
as, as the closing sentiments here um, from you, I, I'd love to hear what are some of the happiness traps that we need to be aware of, obvious ones. Um, and then after that, the conversation, let's go to what are some specific practices we can do to try to nurture happiness or, or joy or contentment, however we want to word that. Uh, happiness hacks, like you talk about in your book. What are some of the, what are some of the things we should be aware of, um, and then what are some of the happiness hacks that we can start to work with, to experience more of the serotonin type happiness? Right. So two traps that come to mind would be that the happiness is something you will acquire in the future, based on your actions. So that 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 it's a you know that this, do this and you will get that if you know. Like that happiness is an if then scenario. And then the okay. other one is a little bit simpler than that. And that is that happiness is a state you will reach through, it's, it's, it's something external. So I guess that to really make it simple, one is that it's a future state that you will attain based on actions. And that second, it will be shaped by externals. Certainly happiness can be influenced by externals. When I'm with my friends or my family or see one of my you know sons doing something that's that's aligned with his purpose. That's giving me a sense of happiness that is, is treated is affected by something external, but it really is. It's, it's, that's not what's making me happy. It's giving me a feeling of happiness, but that is also temporal and shifting. Um, so happiness is not those things. It's not something that you bring in from the outside world or have that, that creates the happiness. What are the okay. Um, touching on that real quick, just, it occurred to me today is cyber Monday. Um, and inevitably somebody will be listening to this thinking, Oh, you, you're saying that getting things won't make me happy. Well, watch how happy I'll be when I go land this big deal, you know, this TV door buster or something like that. And, and I want to emphasize what you just met, mentioned the temporal part of this. So I don't think we're saying those things don't make you happy. We're saying that's not the happiness you're looking for. Great. Sure, you're going to feel uh, that hit of, of dopamine, that sense of feeling of happiness that, wow, I just got this and, and I saved this much money. Um, but what we're talking about is that's not lasting. That's not the deeper, uh, more meaningful type of happiness that we're talking about in this context, right? Right. What an invitation, Noah, that is to mindfulness, because if we look at going and getting that TV and we think not about the what, I'm going to get this TV at this great price, but we really think deeply about the why. Why does this matter? Well, one of the things that I love about um, my life is when friends really gather to sit around and watch a game together or to watch a movie together, and that this it, that this TV will be the way that I really create something I value, which is a sense of deeper community as we come together. So then we can be even mindful about buying a TV. Now, someone might come back and challenge me saying like, oh, come on, you can rationalize anything with thinking like that. And they're probably right. But, <laughs> but really, if we really think about the why, and by the way, if we come up with the why and we go, because I want a TV that's two inches bigger than the one I already have, then we know there's dopamine at work. And we might want to say, hey, you know what? The real thing I care about, which is gathering friends together and you know, sharing community, probably isn't going to be that different than with a two-inch bigger TV than it is with this one. Or maybe we're saying, because you know, because Chris, I'll use a non-gender specific name. So <laughs> <laughs> because Chris has a TV that's 20, that's this size. So I want to have a TV this size. That's information, dopamine. That's dopamine at work. We've been hooked, right? Hi, Jack. So what we can do at that moment is go back and say, well, let's pause for a moment. Get out of reaction. Get into response. Why do I really want this? And come up with a reason that we can really sit with and settle with and say, you know what? It is worth it for me to get it. This really is going to make a difference. Or, you know what? I'm going to do this instead because I already have the thing that's getting me to my why. I just hadn't thought about it that way yet. Mm -hmm. It's funny you mentioned this because I, on Friday for Black Friday, uh, I went and bought a TV at, at Walmart and I, and I was thinking about why. And I, from a rational standpoint, I knew I don't need it. Um, and, and for me, my why was, well, because, because I can. At some point, I know I want to get this uh, a newer TV 
And right now is a good time because it's cheaper than it would be if I didn't do it right now. And I thought maybe that is enough of a why. Um, I knew it wasn't going to make me happier. I knew it does, doesn't make me any better, you know, than, than the me that had the old TV. Um, but I think I, I still felt excited that I got a TV, but it wasn't the same as before in my life where I would have felt like there were other uh, aspects to it that I was unaware of, like thinking of, you know, that the type of TV I have determines who I am or how people see me. They'll come to my house and say, oh, that's one of those big, nice TVs. You know, none of those strings were attached to it this time because I felt like uh, it could be the, uh, an, old, an old TV or no TV and I'd probably be just, just as content, but I can, I can do it. I've, I can afford it right now. So why not? And for me, that, that was enough to say, okay, well then I'll do it. And I was happy that I did it. I'm, I'm, I, I'm happy with the TV I got. So, um, and, I, and I bring that up because we're not saying in this interview, hey, don't go out and fall for these traps. Don't buy the next thing. You can, it's not inherently wrong to do that. What we're saying is don't do that thinking that that's the solution because it's not. Um, but if you do it, you're going to do it. And you, and some people will, um, some people won't, and that's fine. Um, I, I, I just wanted to be careful that we're not trying to say, Oh, people who go out and, and fall for the dopamine hit, you know, the advertised type of happiness, you guys are silly. We're not yeah. saying that at all. I think we're, we're saying just understand what's happening in, in, in your head as you make these choices. <laughs> It is. This is a, it's a great example. And really to be, to, it's, again, it's responding, not reacting. It's doing with awareness and mindfulness and some sort of a sense of purpose. So you, you know, you mentioned with you wanting to get this TV, using a moment to reflect, why am I doing this? Understanding that the things on the surface of your rubber band ball were not the same ones that they were maybe the last time you bought a TV and making a, you know, a conscious decision to say, this is the right time to do it. It's going to last me for this long. Um, it'll be something that the family will grow with more or whatever it is, but really doing it because you are the master of your path, not because somebody else's path is mastering you. Mm, I love that. So you asked for some hacks. Uh, yeah, the, let's talk about some hacks. So I can only share, you know, what I've heard works for others and a few things that have worked for me. Maybe people who are listening have things that they do in these moments where they feel like a sense of angst or unhappiness or someone said to me you know a, a couple of nights ago that they'd gone to this meeting that they really value going to that's about you know personal growth and communication and they came back feeling kind of other than after that meeting like they weren't doing as well as other people so the only thing i can say is that these moments where we feel something is interfering with our happiness just pause for a moment and believe it or not this very simple thing that's always available to us is we can take a breath and it turns out that there are sort of two reasons that are really interesting for this on a neuroscientific level. First of all, the brain integrates information differently on an inhale than it does on an exhale. It actually integrates on the inhale. So a slow and intentional breath is actually an invitation for your brain to sort of, if you will, on an electromagnetic and sort of blood flow level, which, you know, fueling level, which brings oxygen and so forth, to sort of go around and sort of maybe integrate other things maybe opportunistically or maybe intentionally that might not have been available before. One really mindful breath will do that. The other thing is, is when we feel any sort of sense of our happiness, as we define it being threatened, we do get an amygdala response in the brain. This is the very easily triggered fight or flight response. And at that point, there is a chemical reaction that begins instantly in the brain. It's, it begins at, I think, 0.003 seconds, whereas a conscious thought takes at least 0.5 seconds. So it's a really, you know, more than order of magnitude difference that um, we get this chemical surge of about 30 neuromodulators with a, that go even into the body uh, when the amygdala fires instantly. And at that point, an incredible thing happens. There's a constriction of blood flow to the prefrontal cortex. So our most advanced human thoughts actually go offline for a, a moment until either something calms us and brings them back or until we've done the fighting or 
fighting or flighting, I think they say it's fight, flight, or freeze that we need to do to survive, right? But at that amygdala hijack, we are triggered and we are in fight, flight, or freeze mode. So when we feel that awareness of it happening, we can know that that is an evolutionary response that evolved to keep us survive, to keep us, sorry, I don't know what that was, that, that evolved to keep us alive and we can be grateful for it. And then we can come back to a moment of saying, ah, that is an amygdala hijack. And we can hack back on it and come, come back and use the breath or use a centering in the body to say, or we can even say the two things that I find really useful. One is say, can I, you know, we tell ourselves to take a moment, but we can also say if we're in dialogue with another person or in conflict, we can use two very important words and we can say, I'm curious, you know, tell me more about that. And the moment we say I'm curious, we actually are inviting the prefrontal cortex into a different type of consideration, which might be hard at that moment, but once we override it, begins that more integrative access to these more higher, more, these higher cognition parts of the brain. The prefrontal cortex is critical thought, long-term planning, mood regulation, gratitude, right? Um, thoughtful consideration, meta thinking, which is thinking about thinking, and then also sort of on the other hand type of thinking, exactly the opposite of the fast brain, you know, sort of, or even especially uh, amygdala driven responses. So we can use these slow ourselves down processes to drop into that moment and then make decisions that at least eliminate regret, because if we're reacting, we have a higher probability of regretting, which does lead, does remove happiness. But even if we're not moving to a place of happiness, moving to a place of that golden Buddha, that sort of mastery and presence, and I am navigating this mindfully in the moment, that feels really, really good. Okay, I love that, thank you. Um, and I, I want to mention again, uh, Ellen's book is The Happiness Hack. Uh, it's very easy to read. I actually like the way it's laid out uh, with little tips and notes. And uh, it's just, it's, it's really easy to, to read and digest the information in the book. I'm going to post a link to that on the website, on my website, um, where this video and the audio of this interview will also be posted. And then a uh, I'm going to have this whole conversation transcribed so uh, you can read that as well. Um, I'd, I would like to include some other links uh, for those of you who would like to learn more about Ellen's work. Uh, I'll post a link to her TED Talk. Uh, where are some other places, Ellen, where people can learn about you and your, your work or your book? Do you have any specific links or anything you'd like to share? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I would love that. So I do have a website. It's ellenleance.com. And um, now and again, I have a little fun on Twitter. And I have a funny name on Twitter. It's Cheptoom. It's another story, a name I was given in rural Kenya, actually. But it's C-H-E-P, and then the number two, and then the letter M. It's probably the worst Twitter handle in history, <laughs> but it seemed like a good idea at the time. So it's Cheptoom. And I'll share all of those with you, Noah, so that you, uh, you have the direct links. Okay. Well, great. I, I, I want to thank you again for taking the time to um, not just come on the show and be on the podcast, but to be willing to go live um, to my Facebook page I know sometimes the going live aspect can be a little intimidating, um, but I think this is a topic that's very relevant for our uh, culture and our society. It's very relevant to those who are um, practitioners of a mindfulness-based way of living. Um, and I think it correlates really well with the, you know, the practice of, of mindfulness and meditation. So thank you for taking the time to be with us. Do you have any final closing thoughts you want to share with us as we wrap this up? Thank you so much. First of all, what a delight and honor to be with you and with the audience. And I will say if anyone in the audience has any specific questions that they want to add to the thread when Noah posted on Facebook, I will do my best to come in and provide answers to those. So um, thank you and uh, may the conversation continue. <laughs>